In topic A of this module, we studied uh, a couple of concepts. The first thing we studied is that we can use the commutative property to help us solve some unknown uh, multiplication facts. So, for example, 3 times 6. Um, we hadn't until this point really delved into counting by sixes, but we had pretty well mastered counting by threes, so we can relate 3 times 6 to 6 times 3 with the commutative property. Um, and we can count by threes. Um, I'll demonstrate a group count here to help us. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. Um, and that is three, six, uh, six threes. And so I know that if six times three is 18, then three times six is also 18 through the commutative property. Uh, it's worth pausing here for a second, and I'll go over what it means to use the commutative property. You can now see that I have three groups of six. There are six in each row. There are three such rows. Um, the commutative property is simply the idea that if I turn this array, I still have the same total. Now, instead of having three groups of six, three times six, I have six groups of three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and in each group, or each row, there are three. So, it's easy to see that if th three times six is 18. That's 6 times 3, oops, that didn't quite work, will be the same. Let me do that one more time. 3 times 6, 6 times 3. 3 times 6, 6 times 3. No matter how I rotate this array, it always has 18 in it. Uh, and that's the commutative property in a nutshell. The purpose of learning it is exactly that instead of doing the difficult counting by sixes, you can do the easier counting by threes by turning it around. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't practice counting by sixes, but um, it is easier this way. The second thing we learned was another strategy for making difficult multiplication problems easier. And what that was, was relating um, multiplying something by 6 to multiplying it by 5. I'll demonstrate. Let's take, for example, 7 times 6. This is a particularly challenging multiplication problem, I think. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to use the commutative property to change it to 6 times 7. And I'm going to relate it to a fives fact that I know. And what I'm going to do is, instead of solving 6 times 7, I'm going to solve for 5 times 7, and then add another 7. Um, to help me remember to do this first, I'm going to put 5 times 7 in parentheses. Now, 5 times 7 is 5 sevens, or 7 fives. Um, and I'm going to count by fives, not count by sevens, to make this easy. Uh, count along with me. I'm going to count up seven fives. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five. Now, that tells me that I have thirty-five. Now, I can't forget about this. Um, I'm going to take that other 7, and I'm going to add it right on, like that. So I have 35 plus 7, and I can count up to solve for 42. Now, wh why go through that work? Well, this is a strategy that you can use if you don't remember, um, or if counting by 6s and 7s is something that you find challenging, which it is challenging. So this is a good strategy to help you solve um, anything times 6, because you can use this with 8s, with 9s, smaller numbers, doesn't matter. Um, you can always use this strategy. 
of um, multiplying that first factor by 5 and then adding another one. Um, let's take a quick look at why it works. All right, I've added to your view a 7 by 6 array. There's seven groups of 6, and we're going to step through step by step how this works. So the first thing is that I'm showing 7 by 6. This is 7 times 6. This is that array. The next thing I did is I used the commutative property to rotate my array, and we'll see why in a moment. Um, so that was that step. The next thing I did is I started breaking it up. And I broke it up into 5 times 7 and another 7. So what I did is I just shaved off the one row here, like that. I'm now showing this step. This is this part, and this is that part. That middle arrow makes that a little confusing. This is the top. This is that one. 5 times 7 and another 7. Now, what this lets me do is now count by 5s. Now, why? This is the tricky bit. What I can do is use the commutative property again. Watch this. I rotate it back. Now, all of this over here, I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist for a minute. I'm going to black it right out. We'll come back to it. Don't worry. But we're pretending it doesn't exist for just a second. And what I can do now is I count by fives. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. So when I rotate it back, I know, because I counted by fives, that this part of the array is 35. I didn't have to count by sevens, which I find challenging. All I did was I counted by fives after using commutative property, and I know that this little part is worth another seven. Now to find my sum, or my, my, my final product, I take the sum of those two parts. That means I add them together, um, and 35 plus seven is 42. Um, hopefully that, that demonstration with the array makes that more clear. The last thing that we covered was um, introducing something, kind of a new idea here, where we've looked at lots of problems like this, and the question is, what is the unknown factor? That's what that's called, an unknown factor problem. So something times 3 equals 6, and most of you have gotten quite adept at seeing that that would be 2. 2 times 3 equals 6. Now what we introduced is that sometimes we can, if we want to, instead of writing a blank or a question mark, we can use a letter. Um, I'm going to use the letter N. N times 3 equals 6. It could be any letter. It could be a picture of a banana. It doesn't matter. I'm just using it to stand in for my question mark or my blank. N times 3 equals 6. And now what I'm going to do is the question is going to ask, what does N equal? What is N? It equals 2. Now, this is a little strange looking at first. Oops. There we go. And that's because we're just not used to thinking about it this way. It is exactly the same problem as this, where I then fill in the blank with the 2. Same problem. All we're doing is we are calling our blank n. Um, it, it's really as simple as that. You can use it with more complex problems, um, ones with more than one step. Um, let's take this one, for example. 5 plus 2 times 2 equals b. What does b equal? Well, um, we do parentheses first, and we'll cover that in a later video. 
So I see that that is 7, and it then becomes 7 times 2 equals b. So b equals 14, because that's 7 times 2, 2 7, 7 plus 7, 14. Um, if this is confusing, you are normal. Um, that is a normal thing to feel about seeing this for the first time. Um, if you have, feel like you've got it, you must be working really hard in math because this is a challenging topic. Um, and if you feel like you haven't got it yet, don't worry. Um, this is something that you're going to get plenty of time to practice both this year and in the future. And um, it will make sense eventually. Um, it's just going to take some practice and seeing it a lot of time. And um, everyone needs to just keep working on mastering this. Now, in terms of third grade, um, we're not going to see it very much. And in fact, for the most of the rest of elementary school, you're not going to see this very much. What's really important is being to recognize the idea. And the idea really boils down to this familiar problem. This is slightly different than the one I did before. But we see right away that the missing factor is 3. And we see it in lots of different variations. 6 minus something is 1. We see that it's 5. 19 plus 6 equals blank. That's 25. All that we're doing over here is naming those blanks with letters. Um, being able to recognize problems with missing information, that's the important piece. And I think if you just keep on working hard, that's not going to be a problem. I hope these videos about Topic A of Module 3 have been helpful. Um, I'm going to try to get a Topic B video out to you very soon. Uh, enjoy.